Okay, and now it's time for our weekend recap. We're going to kick it off with the undisputed super lightweight title fight between the reigning champion Chantel Cameron and the challenger undisputed welterweight champion Jessica McCaskill, who moved down in weight for this fight, moved down in weight for this opportunity while retaining her status as a champion upstairs at 147 pounds. This fight, this was at 140. The stylistic clash. The boxer versus the puncher. Chantel Cameron being the boxer and Jessica McCaskill being the puncher. More to the point, Chantel Cameron not just being the boxer, being the boxer puncher, and Jessica McCaskill being your, according to Hoyle, mid-range to inside pressure fighter. I often talk about this here on the channel, how the boxer puncher has a stylistic advantage over that pressure fighter by alternating seamlessly between offense and defense, as one alone, one might not be enough to do the job. Too much defense, too much backpedaling, too much lateral movement, and that pressure fighter, they'll outwork you. It's too much defense, too much offense. Too much aggression, too much time in the pocket, and you're making that pressure fighter's job much easier. As they ain't gotta go looking for you. They ain't gotta find you. You're giving them what they want. That's what you're essentially doing. And what gives a box of punch a stylistic advantage over a pressure fighter is they employ a bit of both. Good balance of both offense and defense, alternating between the two when the situation calls for it. That's what Chantel Cameron is. She's a boxer puncher. She can box a bit and she can punch a bit. She's got a mean streak the same as Jessica McCaskill. She's got a mean streak, but Chantel Cameron is not limited to being the aggressor. And that's what won her this fight. Jessica McCaskill, you know what you're in store for, which see is what you get. She's gonna rush you. She's gonna try to crowd you. Chantel Cameron established dominance early in this fight by managing the distance, managing the range, not just with a judicious jab, but with her feet. Pumping out that jab while staying on the balls of her feet, moving around that ring as to not make herself a stationary target that's easy for Jessica McCaskill to catch up to. Taking a half step back, shooting a counter shot. Shooting that jab and then shifting her weight to her front foot, stepping into the punches, stepping Stepping into the shots. This is what I mean when I say that a good boxer puncher alternates between offense and defense. Jessica McCaskill, as we all know, is quite the physical specimen. She's not much of a boxer, but physically, she's strong durable. She can take a hard shot and she can give one. So even if you are having success countering this fighter and stepping into your punches, you don't want to sit in the pocket with her for too long. You don't want to go getting greedy with your combinations, with your shots. You've got to, you've got to alternate. I had Chantel Cameron sweep in the first five rounds in this thing. Amassing an early lead by walking Jessica McCaskill into punches, walking her into shots, Jessica McCaskill is going to come forward. That much you're aware of for the open bell that much you're aware of before the fight it's your job to use that against her that's what Chantel Cameron did amassing a sizable lead early on in the fight if I'm being honest the most I could give Jessica McCaskill were maybe two maybe two two to three rounds and three threes being generous I have to say Chantel Cameron's best round her best round in the fight was the fifth round she was really laying into Jessica who was visibly spent visibly gassed the fifth round was Chantel's best round I'd have to say the ninth and 10th rounds were Jessica's best rounds. Really the ninth, but by then it was too little and too late. Chantel had already amassed a sizable lead over Jessica McCaskill. Chantel Cameron, for the most part, she dominated Jessica McCaskill, and in spots, it looked a lot like she hurt her. There aren't a whole lot of fighters that can handle the kind of pressure and physicality that Jessica McCaskill brings to the table. There really aren't a lot of fighters anywhere in between 135 and 147 that can manage that situation. Chantel Cameron just so happens to be one of the few that can. Stylistically, she had an advantage going into this thing, even if she didn't have... She ain't got the same level of experience that Jessica McCaskill has. She doesn't have Jessica's resume, but she did have a stylistic advantage, and that was enough. Coupled with a slight speed advantage, being somewhat younger than and Jessica, a fresher set of legs. A fresher set of legs coupled with Chantel being a more defensively responsible fighter, a characteristically more defensively responsible fighter than Jessica McCaskill. 8-2 Chantel Cameron was how I scored this thing. 8-2 to 7-3. And the right woman won the fight. She is now this division's undisputed champion. Under normal circumstances. I mean, more often than not. Jessica McCaskill's brand of pressure fighting, however crude it might seem to the spectators in what is this spectator sport, as crude as it might seem, it's gotten her through in the past, but her defensive deficiencies, they caught up to her this time, as Chantel Cameron is that special fighter that has the right blend of offense and defense, both offense 
and defense. Jessica McCaskill's hands, feet were slower than Chantel Cameron's and punches were wider. That created a lot of countering opportunities for Chantel. Outside of a few lumps and bumps, because Chantel didn't walk away from this thing completely unscathed, she took some shots. She did. Chantel won this fight not necessarily through strength of arms. She won this fight with her feet on them. Let's say Chantel Cameron's performance against Jessica McCaskill rivals Katie Taylor. She really did deal with the pressure well. Just like that, she is the latest undisputed champion to be crowned in the sport. Congratulations to her. Wham bam, Chen Cam. El Capo. I want to say that the recurring theme when it came to this entire car, this entire matchroom show was Styles making fights. As Styles as they were, they do make fights. They really do tell you a lot about how a fight's going to look and how a fight's going to play out. In the Super Featherweight Contest, the Men's Super Featherweight Contest between Zelfa Barrett and Rakamov for what was the newly vacated IBF title, the Red Belt, you saw a pure boxer, not to be confused with a boxer puncher, you saw a pure boxer in Zelfa Barrett go up against a pressure fighter, yet another pressure fighter, in Rakamov. You know, the difference between a pure boxer and the boxer puncher is the boxer puncher isn't as uncomfortable in the pocket, isn't as uncomfortable being the aggressor and taking the initiative, they're not as uncomfortable as the pure boxer is doing that. The pure boxer is completely defensively minded. The pure boxer, more often than not, wants to stay safely behind their jab, managing the distance from a safe distance on the balls of their feet, moving laterally. They don't actually want to spend much time in the pocket. They don't want to have to assert themselves. You have to force them to fight, draw them into one, and nobody does that better than a good pressure fighter. And that's what Rakamov is. He was cutting off the ring and stalking Zelfa Barrett. Zelfa Barrett on the move, fighting on the fly, looking to slow things down and set up the counter shots, set up the counter punches. I think Zelfa Barrett, I think he's going to regret the missed opportunities in this fight because he found out early that he can hurt Rakamov and he can drop him, perhaps even stop him if he would have showed a bit more initiative, a bit more aggression, you know, the body shots and the uppercuts. By my count, he hurt Rakamov at least three times. At least three times, and he scored a knockdown at least once, at least once, and he let the guy off the hook. Yeah, by my count, he hurt Rakamov three times, and all three times, he let him off the hook. He didn't lay into him. He didn't do enough to finish this guy and force a referee or corner stoppage. He just didn't do enough. He got back on his bicycle, back on his bike. And he'd only really fight Rakamov whenever he was forced to. He'd only really fight him off whenever he had to, when Rakamov didn't give him much of a choice. As Rakamov kept pinning this guy down, Zelfa Barrett spent the majority of this fight with his back against the ropes, backpedaling and circling away, looking to set up counter shots and occasionally showed a burst of aggression, couple of salvos, some combinations. You could see that Zelfa, if he applies himself, he's got enough speed and power and variety the shots that he could get Rakamov out of there. He just has to push the envelope. He's got to be the aggressor. Take the initiative. Pure boxers being as defensively minded as they are, that just so happens to be the bane of the pure boxer. They're not known for taking the initiative and taking it to the other man. Quite the opposite. They want to slow a fight down, stay behind their jab, and set up counter shots, allowing the other guy to lead the dance. In that situation, when it comes to that dynamic, the pressure fighter, while they don't have a stylistic advantage over a boxer puncher, they do have a stylistic advantage over a pure boxer because the pure boxer pure boxers call and caught his defense more than offense pure boxes they don't alternate seamlessly from offense to defense the same way that boxer punchers do now the pure boxers calling card is defense and while that pressure fighter can more or less smoke them out and force them to fight pressure fighters being as physically imposing and as aggressive as they are as stubborn as they are they put that pure boxer in a situation where they have to fight they have to or they're going to eventually get run over and eventually Rakamov ran over Zelfa Barrett scoring two knockdowns in the eighth round I believe it was the eighth round Zelfa Barrett he was physically spent he didn't have anything left you know pure boxers they favor a more relaxed pace slow pace fight where they get to set up their shots pick their shots long distance long range if the pure boxer is a sniper a sniper rifle that would make the pressure fighter a gatling gun that's what pressure fighters are aggressive guys that throw punches in bunches that's what Rakamov Rakimov is a stubborn customer that in spite of being floored early in the fight, he didn't give up and he didn't lay off. He laid into Zelfa Barrett. 
and he eventually wore him out. He is now this division's newly crowned IBF champion, but he's not out of the woods yet. He now has Joe Cordina, former IBF Joe Cordina, who was quite unjustly stripped of the red belt, stripped of the IBF title. He has Joe Cordina to answer to. So, I mean, congratulations to Rakamov, but all things considered, he's not out of the woods yet. About to have another matchroom fighter, yet another matchroom fighter hot on his trail to reclaim what is his. And I'd wager that Joe Cordina can land with a bit more authority than Zelfa Barrett did. This is not over. We then come to the main event of that same card, the light heavyweight title fight between Dimitri Bivol, the unbeaten champion, versus Zerto Ramirez, the then unbeaten challenger, a guy with two times, about two times as many fights as Dimitri. On paper, it looked like this was going to be a hard fight for Dimitri Bivol. This guy, he's a lot bigger than a Canelo Alvarez. He seems at least physically more cut out to campaign as a light heavyweight than Canelo is. Stylistically, it looked like he had some of the right tools, the right ingredients for the job, physically imposing size, leading with his right hand as opposed to his left, him being a southpaw, and Dimitri being an orthodox fighter. Zerto being somewhat of a body puncher, decent one. I mean, on paper, it looked like it had all the makings of a competitive fight and what could have proven to be an arduous task for the reigning champion, the reigning champion Dimitri Bivol. I myself went with Dimitri to win a points decision against Zerto Ramirez on the premise that in spite of Dimitri not having as many professional fights as Zerto, the fights that he did have were against better fighters than the fighters that Zerto had been fighting. That Dimitri Bivol has seen more of. He's seen more of what Zerto brings to the table than Zerto has seen of what Dimitri brings to the table. How many elusive fighters and cerebral guys, world-class boxers, has Zerto shared the ring with versus how many of those guys has Dimitri shared the ring with? Dimitri has dealt with fighters that have a size advantage before. Taller fighters and aggressive punchers. Taller fighters like Craig Richards, aggressive punchers like Joe Smith Jr. and Jean Pascal. So I did go with Dimitri to win this thing, but I didn't think it was going to be this easy. I didn't really expect him to be this dominant. I got to tell you, I don't know how the judges scored it. I don't know exactly, but I had this thing... 11 rounds to 1, maybe 10 rounds to 2 in favor of the champion, in favor of Dimitri Bivol. We learned a lot about Dimitri in this fight we did. To the eye, if you've been keeping up with Dimitri Bivol throughout his career, all the way back to his days on HBO, he has the look of a pure boxer, a defensively minded guy who's going to fight a safety first kind of fight and do enough, just enough. More often than not, Dimitri Bivol looks like a pure boxer. He has the look of a pure boxer, the implementation, the execution. But in this fight, he was more of a boxer puncher. Let's talk about why that is. For from the opening bell, the early goings of this fight, Dimitri Bivol didn't backpedal, didn't lay off, didn't circle away from Zerto Ramirez. Quite the opposite. He came forward and stayed with him, stayed on him, fencing with the jab, as to not stay too far on the outside of Zerto, allowing Zerto to come forward and get something going. No, Dimitri met him head on. He met him head on and he stayed within striking distance of Zerto. So should Zerto try to come forward, he can pop him with a counter shot, pop him with a jab. Dimitri having a speed advantage. Having both faster feet and faster hands than Zerto Ramirez. That's what allowed Dimitri to do this and do this safely. To stay in the pocket with Zerto. If you're confused about what the pocket is, what that... If you want to know what the pocket is, the pocket is when both fighters are within striking distance of each other. Both Dimitri Bivol and Zerto Ramirez, they're close enough to each other that both guys can touch each other with shots. The difference is Bivol's faster. He's faster on his feet. Then Zerto Ramirez, a flat-footed pressure fighter that draws his power from the ground up, whereas Dimitri, he fights on the balls of his feet, has to quickly get out of the way of any oncoming fire. He's faster on his feet, and he's got faster hands than Zerto Ramirez. Zerto, whose punches are a little wider, easier to counter, because they're also slower. He stayed with Zerto Ramirez, stayed on top of him, popped him with counter shots, and forced him back, forced him onto his back foot. Zerto Ramirez, being a pressure fighter, he's not accustomed to fighting on his back foot. That's not what he does. That's not who he is as a fighter. And in doing so, 
and forcing Zerto onto his back foot as opposed to allowing him to gain momentum, shift his weight over to his front foot, come forward with shots, and forcing Zerto back, he essentially disarmed him. It's not dissimilar from what we saw last week in the Ellie Scottney versus Mary Romero fight, where Ellie Scottney, she's doing the same thing that Dimitri Bivol was doing in this fight, staying with and staying on top of the pressure fighter as to force them back, force them on their back foot, not allow them to come forward and gain any momentum, get into a groove. That's what Dimitri did to Zerto Ramirez, in tandem with beating his head like a drum, salvos of punches, sequences of shots, straight shots from the outside coming in. He couldn't miss Zerto Ramirez. Whenever he did, let his hands go. In the exchange, in those moments where both guys were letting their hands go at the same time, Dimitri Bivol by far and wide was getting the better end of the exchange. And suddenly, Zerto Ramirez's height and reach and his power, none of it mattered. Like I said, I only really gave two rounds to Zerto Ramirez, and the, both of those rounds seemed to me like rounds that Dimitri Bivol quite deliberately was taking off as to gather strength. But he wasn't busy in those rounds, but he wasn't trying to be. Forcing the otherwise aggressive characteristic come forward pressure fighter onto his back foot. A stroke of genius from Dimitri Bivol. Just staying with him, fencing, waiting for the moment where he tries to come forward so you can catch him with a shot, catch him coming in between the forward momentum of Zerto Ramirez and the counter punching from Dimitri Bivol, he effectively neutralized one of the more aggressive and physically imposing pressure fighters in today's light heavyweight division. And I said it ahead of the fight, this fight with Zerto is more or less a rehearsal for a more dangerous fight with a more dangerous fighter, pressure guy, in Artur Betterbeef. That's the only fight to make at 175 pounds. Let's not waste each other's time. He essentially stayed on top of Zerto so he could greet him at the front door before he got to come inside. Laid into him often enough to cause him to simmer down when needed. Congratulations to Dimitri Bivol for one of the more dominant showings. He made it look easy.